Ezekiel 33.3. This topic is called the tribes of Israel and the lost tribes. A lot of people, since they don't know their Old Testament very well, they know the gospel, if that, when you throw these kind of topics out there, there's so much fluff and so many movies and manipulation because of course if you don't know it it's any anyone's game to try to take your mind and twist you in a weird direction so we're going to start off looking at some of the history of the 12 tribes because you need to actually understand what the bible says so you can actually see how this history aligns with the bible because if you don't know the bible then it's not going to be as impactful for you so in order to understand this history you do need to know the lineage from adam to jacob so we'll cover that first we're going to take a brief look at the history of Judea and Israel. There is a difference. You have to understand that difference. It's extremely important. We're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. It's sorry, chapter 28. We'll look at the blessings and curses. This is extremely important for understanding what happened. And then we're going to take a look at some hidden North American history. And you're going to love it. You'll absolutely love it. Names like Columbus come up. We're going to take a look a lot closer at things like Thanksgiving. It's going to be fun. Starting with the genealogy of Adam. So we're going to look at from Adam to Jacob. So Jacob, we know later, was renamed Israel. So we have Adam and Eve. The first children were born outside of the garden because Adam and Eve had already sinned. And then they were outside the garden when they had Cain and Abel. And then Cain kills Abel. We studied that last week and some of the interesting connections behind that. And then there was another child that was born, which was Seth. And so we can see the continuation from Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahali, Jared. Jared, if you remember, that's Genesis 6-4. Genesis 6-4 was when the angels and man came together to make this hybrid. Some translations said Nephilim. The Greek said Gigantes. English sometimes said giants or the mighty men of renown. Then we had Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, the father of Noah. And then we have Noah. And then, of course, we know the flood. So we're going to focus on the bloodline of Shem because Shem is where Jacob comes through. So he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jacob, Japheth, sorry. Japheth, as you've studied, he made up most of Europe and Asia. Ham, that's Africa, or at least he should have been in Africa. And then Shem, that's the Middle East, Mesopotamia. The lineage of Noah to Abraham. So from Noah, we go from Shem, and then we're just following down the line of Shem. Eventually, we get to Terah. Terah was the father of Abraham. Abraham was actually called Abram until he turned 90, and then he was renamed to Abraham. That's very similar to Jacob as well, because Jacob was renamed. You'll find that when people come close to God and they stop wrestling with God, they're given a new name. So Abram becomes Abraham, and then Abraham and Sarah have a child called Isaac. There was a story where Isaac was nearly sacrificed. Then we have Isaac and Rebekah, and they give birth to twins. One twin was called Jacob, but the elder that came out first was Esau. And in the story, we see that Esau was having his heel held by Jacob. So this term Achilles heel that you see in mythology has a lot to do with this story. Jacob is actually where you get the idea of Jack, like a carjacker or a hijacker, someone who steals something. You'll say he jacked me. The reason why is because Jacob jacked the blessing of Esau. That's where that comes from. Esau was the child that looked different. He was the only child in the Bible that was described. We were all supposed to just assume that everyone looked kind of the same, but then Esau looked very different. And the reason why is he was described as being red. His skin was red. So red or Edom, Edom means red, and Esau were the Edomites, so the red people. You can think of it like the red people. The reason why is likely because if you have a child that has less melanin, it's possible to have one parent that's darker and then a child that becomes lighter, because to have a lighter child, all you need is less melanin. If the eyes are blue, means the eyes have less melanin. If the skin is lighter, it means the skin has less melanin. Melanin is what makes people dark. So dark eyes and dark skin is associated to people that have more melanin. So Jacob gets renamed to Israel. And then he has four wives. And we went through the story as to why polygamy is not something supported in the Bible. This is just what happens when human beings come up with their own decisions. And you see that a lot in the Bible. You're not dealing with perfect people. So we have Leah, Bilhah, Zilpah, and Rachel. Rachel was the wife that Jacob or Israel had wanted. And then Leah was the older sister that he was tricked into having by the father. And then Bilhah and Zilpah were the two, uh, you can call them slave mates. So when you look at Leah, 
you'll see it starts with Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dina, in that order. So up to Zebulun, these are all boys. There was one girl that Leah had, which was Dina. And then Bilhah had Dan and Naphtali. Zilpah had Gad and Asher. We're going to take a look at Gad today. That's a really important one we'll look at today. And then Rachel had Joseph and Benjamin. So if we take a look here, Levi is another one we're going to focus on. Levi is where Moses came from and Aaron, the high priest. When you read the book of Exodus, it's really centered around these two. Moses, obviously, the Ten Commandments, let my people go. And now we're going to do a brief history of Israel and Judea. So I had to bring you up from Adam and Eve all the way to Jacob and then Levi and Moses, because you have to understand this history coming from Moses to understand what's going on with this topic today. So if we take a look here, are the books of the Old Testament specifically, and they're kind of stacked so you can see the order. You can see there's overlap with some books. But when we take a look at Exodus with the Levites and Moses, we're talking around 1500 BC. So ballpark within that area there. So we'll start there. So Moses, he's in the wilderness. So was Aaron. Basically, they had fled from Egypt, right? Let my people go. All the people left. Once they had left Egypt, they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And they weren't spending 40 years because they didn't know the way. They spent 40 years because the previous generation was stubborn. And the previous generation wouldn't let go of the things that they were still doing in Egypt. So the Lord made the decision to let them wander in circles until all the elders had passed away. And then Joshua and that new generation, they were the ones that came into the promised land because they weren't corrupted by the things in Egypt. They were able to obviously separate because the children would only learn from their parents the things that they weren't supposed to be doing. So the 40 years in the wilderness, here's the path it could have been the path it's a possible route there's a couple possible routes but it doesn't matter the key is is that they left from egypt they somehow crossed through the sinai peninsula and then they crossed over into what you would call today arabia and then made their way up north and then they came around the dead sea eventually coming into the promised land with joshua moses didn't actually get to go into the promised land he died on top of a mountain i believe it was mount nebo we studied recently so that was it. He saw them go into the promised land, but he himself didn't go. And if you take a look here on the right hand side, this is this tabernacle, which later became Solomon's temple, which later became Zerubbabel or Herod's temple. Depends on what books you look at in history. But basically, this is the Temple Mount in Israel. It used to be a temporary sanctuary. They would wander around with it like a bunch of tents up until the times of Solomon. We're talking roughly around 1000 B.C., that's when this temple was built. So with the conquest of Canaan, what happened was Moses, he didn't actually get to see them enter the promised land. So you can see the river Jordan. It's like this dividing line. And then you can see they went into Jericho, Bethel, etc. So this was Joshua. Joshua went on a series of conquests because, of course, this land was owned by other people, which was the Canaanites. But they weren't supposed to be there. Eventually, what happened was when the Canaanites became defiled enough they were just corrupted they were doing everything from cannibalism to sacrificing their children to these different gods that they worshiped this is eventually when joshua was given the order to come in and just clean house so they entered canaan in the book of joshua so when we talk about the torah the torah is the first five books of the bible it's also called the first five books of moses or the pentateuch penta meaning five Right after Deuteronomy, that's the final book of the Torah, we have the book of Joshua. And that's when these conquests happened and they came into this land of Canaan. So on the left-hand side, this is what the land looked like before it was divided. On the right-hand side, this is when the land of Canaan was divided amongst these 12 tribes. So we can see here their different names on the map. Some actually shared a space with each other. For example, the Levites, you won't find the Levites anywhere on the map because they had to do the temple service. So the ones who had to work in the temple, they didn't have their own land. They were actually in Judea or Judah on the map here. So they worked inside of the temple and they were basically provided for by their brothers. That's why you see tithes. A tithe has to do with a tenth. They had to get money from their brothers or belongings from their brothers because if they're doing all this work inside the temple, they don't have any capability to take care of themselves. So they need their brothers to support them. So this is where tithe comes from. But again, the land was divided. This was the former land of the Canaanites. 
And if you look, for example, at the tribe of Dan, Dan's right where the tip of the arrow is. Beneath Dan, you have Philistia. So you can still see that there were still some remnants of Canaan. You can see the surrounding nations. So for example, Edom, Edom is towards the south under the Dead Sea. Zor is around where Sodom and Gomorrah was. Moab are the Moabites. They're going to come up in this lesson too. And then we can see the Armenians, Amun. So they were still kind of surrounded by these other nations. What happens was you had a king called Solomon. And Solomon was after his father, King David. King David was a great king, but just like everyone else, he sinned as well. We're not going to talk about the sins of David. We're not really going to talk about the sins of Solomon either. But what I will point out is that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And then what ended up happening was the people had to pay for his lavish lifestyle and funding his wives because he raised the taxes. Following him was his son. His son was Rehoboam. So after Solomon came King Rehoboam. Now Rehoboam, the people begged him and said, don't be like your father. Reduce the taxes. You know, we'll be faithful, loyal to you, but please don't be like your father. And this young man, because he was a fairly young king, instead of going towards the elders and taking their consultation, he went to his friends. And his friends like, no, you should just jack up the taxes even more. Show that you're tougher than your father. So basically, if you're going to feel the sting of Solomon, now you're going to feel the sting of Rehoboam. And I believe it was associated to a scorpion, if I remember correctly. But regardless, Rehoboam was going to be tougher than his father. This leads to the kingdom splitting into two. What once was 12 tribes that were all united together sharing one temple, and that temple was in Jerusalem. That's where the sacrifices were. Now we got a split. We've got King Rehoboam. He's the legitimate king. Even though he's not necessarily the best king, he's still the legitimate king. He's ruling from the south in Jerusalem. And then we have an Ephraimite. He was from the northern kingdom because Ephraim on the map was above in this area that's called Israel. So they called the top part Israel or the northern kingdom of Israel. And the bottom part was called Judea. So you need to remember that. North was Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. The south was Judea. So you can see the split. Samaria was actually the capital of Israel. So again, we're talking the northern kingdom of Israel, this plot of land that was the other tribes. So Judea was just basically a couple tribes. The majority of the tribes, though, they were all in the north. So when we talk about the lost tribes, it has a lot to do with the fact that they were disconnected from their brothers in the south. Samaria is also where you get the word Samaritan, like a good Samaritan. And it's kind of ironic we say that because there's some funny history you're going to learn about the Samarians. So at the time when the kingdom split, that's around 931 BC. So you can see right here, the book of Amos, the book of Hosea, and then Samuel and Chronicles, they all detail what happened with the split. You'll see different verses that kind of talk about this. So Samaria, once again, was the northern kingdom capital. And what they did was they set up their own altars. They set up their own place of worship because they decided they're not going to come all the way to the south anymore since they have their own king and their own king was separate. They had their own separate kingdom. Why would I travel all the way from the north and bring a goat or bring, you know, a lamb to do a sacrifice for sin when that's so far away? Instead, we'll have our own priests. Now, if you remember from the Sabbath studies in Exodus, the priesthood was specific to the Levites, but the Levites were found in Jerusalem. There weren't Levites in Samaria. So they had to appoint another tribe member or different tribe members to fill the role of the priests. And it went completely apostate. Hosea 8, 4, and 6. They set up kings, but not by me. So you can see the me is an uppercase. So that's the Lord that's speaking. So in other words, the nation in Hosea, you can tell it's the North Kingdom. They set up their own kings, but they weren't appointed by God. Rehoboam, even though he wasn't a great king, he was still the appointed king. It goes on and says, they make princes, but without my approval. With their silver and gold, they make themselves idols to their own destruction. So you can tell right here in Hosea, the northern kingdom had set up idols to worship. And they were already told earlier in the, in the Torah, do not set up idols. And we're actually going to read about that shortly. So it says to their own destruction. It's a very big deal if you start worshiping objects, whether that object is a statue whether the object is the earth, whether the object is the sun, the moon, or the stars, eventually it will lead you to your own destruction. It goes on and says, he has rejected your calf, O Samaria. So you can tell in Samaria, the northern kingdom, 
they had set up a calf image, kind of what you saw when they were leaving in the book of Exodus. Remember, when Moses went on the mountain to grab the Ten Commandments, they thought, hey, it's been 40 days. This guy's dead. Let's set up a new God. And they set up the same calf that they must have been worshiping in Egypt or something similar to what they were doing in Egypt. So again, you can see this repeat back into degenerating themselves with idol worship. So he has rejected your calf, O Samaria. So the Lord says, I'm rejecting your false idol. My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of innocence? For this thing is from Israel. A craftsman made it. It is not God. It will be broken to pieces, that calf of Samaria. And you will find that's what happened because Hosea is a prophet and Hosea is trying to warn people to not do what they're doing, but they're stubborn. They don't listen. They just do whatever their hearts desire. So what we see is Samaria ends up being taken. And that's obviously the end of the golden calf worship because the people were taken from the north. The whole northern kingdom was taken and the southern kingdom was untouched. Second Kings 17. In the 12th year of the reign of Ahaz over Judah, Hosea, the son of Elah, became the king of Israel. So we're talking the northern kingdom now. So you can see the two kings. So Ahaz, that's the king of Judah. And then we see Hosea, son of Elah, that's the king of Israel. So again, the split. And he reigned in Samaria nine years. So Hosea, not the prophet. This is a different one. It's similar spelling. Hosea reigned as king in Samaria for nine years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like the kings of Israel who preceded him. So we can tell that before they were into idol worship, but this was like extra evil. So he must have been doing additional stuff. Now we know that the Canaanites, they had went as far as sacrificing their children. And this eventually led to their own destruction. Perhaps this is what's going on in the days of Hosea, this king. Solomon's our king of Assyria attacked him and Hosea became his vassal and paid him tribute. So basically the king of Assyria attacks the northern kingdom and says you have to pay tribute. So if you if you lose in a war, you have to pay, we call today things like reparations for war, they call it tribute. You have to pay the other nation money to basically keep them from destroying you. But the king of Assyria dis discovered that Hosea had conspired to send envoys to the king of Soy of Egypt and that he had not paid tribute to king of Assyria as in previous years. So we can tell in the beginning, after the Assyrians must have done some damage to the northern kingdom, they decided they'd pay tribute. But then as time went on, you can see there's some conspiring going on between the king of the north and the kingdom of Egypt. So in other words, he's trying to make some allies so he can either overthrow the Assyrians or at least not have to pay the tribute of the Assyrians. And when the Assyrian king figures this out, he's mad. Therefore, the king of Assyria arrested Hosea and put him in prison. So they took the king of the northern kingdom and then arrested him. Israel carried captive to Assyria. Then the king of Assyria invaded the whole land, marched up to Samaria, and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and carried away the Israelites to Assyria, where he settled them in Hala, in Gazan, by the harbor river, and in the cities of the Medes. All this happened because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God. In other words, the Lord allowed them to be captured. The prophet comes and warns you, stop doing what you're doing. Stop doing these different types of customs, traditions, rituals, these things the surrounding nations are doing. You can't do them, but they did it anyway. And so then what the Lord does is he allows another nation. This happens many times in the Bible. When the people are stubborn and they won't listen, the Lord allows an enemy nation to come in and overtake them. So here we can see that the Israelites, the North Kingdom, not the South, they've been overtaken by the Assyrians. So it says, because they had sinned against the Lord, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They had worshipped other gods and walked in the customs of the nations that the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. So what's the major offense here? They worshipped other gods and they kept the customs of other nations. Today, we call these things traditions, holidays, right? This is a really serious thing. If you want the God of Israel to be your God, if you partake in these other rituals, traditions, customs, holidays, every time this happened to the Israelites, bad things happen. The prophet would come and warn them, and then eventually the Lord just gets stubborn and says, take them. 
as well as in the practices introduced by the kings of Israel. So it wasn't just things that were customs and practices of the surrounding nations and the worship of other gods. Northern Israel themselves had introduced new practices. Do not practice the customs or worship the gods of other nations. This is what the Bible teaches you. It gives you several stories where God's own people become utterly destroyed. The temple becomes utterly destroyed during the Babylonian captivity because they refuse to obey one God. They keep doing all these different things just thinking it's no big deal. I don't see a problem with it. So here's the Assyrian captivity. Here's a map of when it happened. So we can see 9th century, and then we can also see here 745 to 727. So there were multiple, you know, grabbings of people and putting them out. Keep in mind, you're grabbing like 10 tribes. So some of them went up on this route you see in purple, and they came up to Nineveh. Nineveh actually shows up in some other books. You'll actually see the, uh, the story of uh, one of the prophets inside of a whale. But here you can also see Assyria and Ashur. So two different routes to basically take the people, these different tribes who had rebelled and said, we're going to do it our way, take them into an enemy nation. If you think this history isn't true, the problem you have is in the British Museum, the Assyrian captivity is captured in this rock bust. This is the southwest, this was found in the southwest palace of Tilgath Pilsner III at Nimrud. And if you look at this map we just looked at, that route that you see that's uh, this kind of a red line, that's where Tilgath Pilsner III, that's his route. So that's this bust here. This is actually in the British Museum today. You cannot deny that this is not history. Now we're going to take a look at the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 28, and we're going to look at the blessings and curses, because the blessings and curses directly line up with what you've just seen here. And it's also going to explain what happened with the transatlantic slave trade. And there was more than just the transatlantic slave trade. If you think the transatlantic slave trade was the most horrendous slave trade that ever happened, there was a much larger slave trade, but they never taught you about it in school. Today, you're going to learn about it. And I don't know why they wouldn't tell you about a slave trade that's bigger than the one that's associated to taking all the people from West Africa and then bringing them into the United States and obviously South America. Deuteronomy 28, it's titled Blessings for Obedience in some of the Bibles. If you fully obey the Lord your God, remember this, it says if. So that means you're given an ultimatum. If you don't do it, then there's going to be another deal that you get. It says if. You fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commandments. Not a couple, all of them. I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you. Here it is, if you obey the Lord your God. So in other words, the people are being told here, if you listen, if you obey the statutes, laws, and commandments given to Moses, you will be blessed. But you're going to find out what the flip side is if you don't in a moment. So it goes on and says, you will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruits of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks, your basket and your kneading trowel will be blessed. You'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. So it goes on. There's a lot more than this. And it just tells what all these different blessings are. So we can see if the people obey the law that God gave to Moses, right? The Ten Commandments and the statutes, there was a series of things. They'd be blessed. But here on Deuteronomy, it gives you what happens if you're cursed. Actually, in just a moment, I'm going to keep reading this, actually, because I want you to see all the blessings. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to, so all your works. The Lord God will bless you in the land he has given you. The Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised you on oath. But again, here's the ultimatum. If you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him, so you can't do what you want, then all the peoples on the earth will see that you were called by the name of the Lord, and they will fear you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity and the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, and the crops of your ground, and the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. The Lord will open up the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in the season, 
and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. I'll repeat that. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today, to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. So you cannot be involved with the worship of gods of other nations, the customs, rituals, and practices of other nations. This is the ultimatum that Israel was given if you want to be blessed. However, if you want to be cursed, let's go on to Deuteronomy 28.15. If, however, you do not obey the Lord your God by carefully following all his commandments and statutes I am giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. So in other words, if you listen, you're going to be blessed. If you don't listen, you'll be cursed. So you have to understand when the Lord says something, he doesn't just say it willy-nilly. For example, maybe you were growing up, your parents said, if you don't do your homework, you're not going to get to play video games after. And then all of a sudden your parents are like, well, you know, he's really, trying. you know, you can still play video games. No, the Lord doesn't do that. If he makes a promise before the people, he fulfills that promise. So you have to understand if the Lord says he'll bless you, he will commit. However, if the Lord says he curses you, he has to do what he said, regardless of whether he wants to do it or not. He can't be willy nilly like we are. He has to be firm. So you would hope that if the curses were something you should be fearful of, you would hope that your ancestors would be smart enough to listen. Because when you hear what the curses are, the curses explain a lot of what's happened throughout history and we'll be able to prove it today. Deuteronomy 28, 63 to 68. Just as it pleased the Lord to make you prosper and multiply, so it will also please him to annihilate you and destroy you, and you will be uprooted from the land you are entering to possess. In other words, if you're going to steal, if you're going to kill, if you're going to lie, if you're going to sleep with other people's wives, if you're going to break these rules that are moral rules, I have no problem destroying you. Then the Lord will scatter you among all the nations. Let me repeat that. Then the Lord will scatter you among all the nations from one end of the earth to the other. And there you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your fathers have known. Among those nations, you will find no repose, not even a resting place for the sole of your foot. There the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and a, des a despairing soul. So your life will hang in doubt before you, and you will be afraid day and night, never certain of survival. In the morning, you will say, if only it were evening. And the evening you will say, if only it were morning, because of the dread in your hearts of the terrifying sights you will see. The Lord will return you to Egypt in ships by a route that I said you should never see again. There you will sell yourselves to your enemies as male and female slaves. I'll repeat that. There you will sell yourselves to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one will buy you. Let me point something out about the Old Testament. A lot of times when you see the word Egypt, Egypt doesn't mean today what you would call modern day Egypt. Egypt is in Africa. And a lot of times when the Bible is talking about Egypt, it's talking about the whole continent of Africa. Deuteronomy 28. The Lord through Moses told the tribes if they kept the law, they'd be blessed. The Lord through Moses told the tribes if they broke the law, they would be cursed. It's pretty fair. Keep in mind, the curse hasn't been committed yet. We just told all the ancestors, this is what's going to happen, and it's all going to be based on your moral behavior. If your moral behavior goes sideways, you are going to be cursed. If your moral behavior stays upright, and it's not upright subjectively, it's objectively. It's based on the laws and statutes handed down to Moses, not whatever your heart desires. This is what they would experience. Here's the curses. They would be conquered by other nations. They would worship gods of wood and stone. They would experience genocide. They would be taken as slaves. They'd be taken in boats to Egypt. Remember, Africa. Now we're going to look at the hidden North American history. And I think anyone who's a history buff, you're going to love this. 
This is Bat Creek, Tennessee. And in Bat Creek, Tennessee, they found something very interesting during an archaeological dig. I'm surprised that we weren't taught this in school. This is called the Bat Creek Stone. The Bat Creek Stone was professionally excavated in 1889 from an undisturbed burial mound in eastern Tennessee by the Smithsonian Mound Survey Project. So the Smithsonian Museum, they found this. The director of the project, Cyrus Thomas, initially declared that the curious inscription on the stone were beyond question, the letters of the Cherokee alphabet. So Cherokee, who are the Cherokee? Well, wouldn't we call those Native Americans living in the States? Yeah, the Cherokee. So this was supposed to be owned by the Cherokee, according to the Smithsonian. In the 1960s, Henriette Mertz and Corey Aob both noticed that the inscription, when inverted from Thomas's orientation to that of the above photograph, instead appeared to be ancient Semitic. So wait a minute, the Cherokee people had this, but it was upside down. You had to flip it the right way, because when you flip it the right way, it's not a, a language of the Cherokee, at least not that we know, it's the language of the Hebrews. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's the Phoenician Canaanite language, and I'll show you. The late Semitic languages scholar Cyrus Gordon confirmed that it is Semitic, and specifically Paleo-Hebrew, so an old Hebrew, of approximately the first or second century AD. That's strange. What is that doing in the United States? According to him, the five letters to the left of the comma, shaped word divider read from the left to the right, L, Y, H, WD or for Judea, because you have to remember in Hebrew or Paleo Hebrew, there's no vowels. He noted that the broken letter on the far left is consistent with Mem, which is a Hebrew letter, in which case this word would instead read L Y H W D M or for the Judeans. Why do the Cherokee Native Americans have a stone with Hebrew writing on it that says? for the Judeans, and why didn't you learn that in school? Considering this was something discovered in the 1890s and the 1960s, they had clarified what the inscription actually said. They just left that detail out. So the Smithsonian was reading this upside down. What this actually says is holiness to the Lord, or Kadesh and then Lord. And there's a couple different variations of Hebrew. There was Hebrew just kind of evolved a bit over time and if you follow hebrew back far enough it's not really hebrew it's the canaanite language and the canaanite language came from egyptian hieroglyphics exodus 39 and 30 to 31 and they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and wrote upon it a writing like the engravings of a signet holiness to the lord then they fastened it of, say, fastened to it a blue cord to mount it on the turban, just how the Lord had commanded Moses. If you're studying during our Wednesday Bible studies, you know what this is about. When the priesthood, the Levites, when they were becoming ordained as priests, they were told they had to dress a certain way. Well, now we're seeing that there's some details here regarding the high priest and the turban that the high priest would wear, not the mitra, the turban. The turban had the signet that said, holiness to the Lord. Why did the Native American Cherokee in the United States have this written on their stone? Here you can see the exact same thing in Hebrew. So I just showed the translation on the bottom. So Hebrew's read from right to left, but in this case here, the first word is holiness in yellow, and then the last word is Lord. So holiness to the Lord is the translation, but it's holiness and Lord. This is what was written in an old Hebrew script on the Bat Creek Stone. So the golden crown of the high priest on the right hand side, this is how the priest should look in the church. Very different than what we see in Roman Catholicism. This is the turban he wore. You can see he's wearing something that looks like an apron. We studied this on the, on the Wednesday Bible studies as well. But you can see in the center, these are those two words. So this is holiness. That's the word on the right. Lord, that's the word on the left. So when you flip it around, what you're actually looking at is Exodus 39, 30. This isn't a language of the Cherokee per se. This is a Semitic language. This is Paleo Hebrew Phoenician script. What is this doing in the United States? Why didn't you learn about this? Pretty big detail. 
As a matter of fact, if you take a look here, here's a book from the 1800s, and it's actually talking about this exact stone. And if you compare it, you can clearly see, sure, you're missing a letter, but this is identical. Why were the Cherokee writing in, in Phoenician Hebrew? That's a million dollar question. Now we're going to take a look at a place called Newark, Ohio. So that's just north of where we were looking. In Newark, they found something called the Holy Stones. Again, did anyone learn about this in school? Here it is. They opened up this little container here in Newark, and inside of it, what did they find? It looks like some little guy with the same or similar type of writing going around it. This is actually block Hebrew. You can find this at the Johnson Humrick House Museum, and this again is in Ohio. But there was other objects found as well. We're going to focus on the first one. It's called the Decalogue. The Newark, Ohio Holy Stones. In November of 1860, David Wyrick of Newark, Ohio, found an inscribed stone in a burial mound about 10 miles south of Newark. I guess they didn't have enough time to get this in the school curriculum because, you know, 1860, that's so close to today. The stone is inscribed on all sides with a condensed version of the Ten Commandments or the Decalogue and a peculiar form of post exilic square Hebrew letters. The robed and bearded figure on the front is identified as Moses in letters fanning over his head. Okay, so now we've got two things coming from Israel, or it must have came from Israel. Who's speaking Hebrew on this side of the world? So this is Moses. The character we saw in the Decalogue, this is Moses. And around him, the Ten Commandments. What is this doing in the United States? They also found this. It was the Keystone, New York, Ohio. And this, if you look, you can clearly see that's the Hebrew letter Shin. So you can't pretend this is in Hebrew. Why do we find that Native American people are leaving behind these artifacts and what is on them? A language that see, would seem probably unfamiliar to them, at least with the history that you were told. Newark, Ohio Keystone. Several months earlier, in June of 1860, Wyrick had found an additional stone, also inscribed in Hebrew letters. Again, why didn't this make it in the curriculum? Just wasn't important? This stone shown above is properly known as the Keystone because of its general shape. However, it is too rounded to have actually served as a Keystone. It was apparently intended to be held with the knob in the right hand and turned to read the four sides in succession, perhaps repetitively. So here's what the four sides of the stone had. It's all Hebrew. Why are we finding these artifacts with Hebrew writing in the United States? And why is it showing up amongst the Native Americans, the indigenous people, the aboriginals? What's going on here? Keystone inscription. So what does it actually say? Well, on one side it says, Kadesh Koshim, Holy of Holies. That sounds pretty familiar. We saw the same thing or similar on the Bat Creek stone of the Cherokee people, and they were just south of this location. Melek Eretz, meaning king of the earth. Melek, Melek, that's king. That's king in Hebrew. Torah, Yahweh. Okay, this is specific now, because now we're seeing the word Lord, the law of God. And then Devor Yahweh, the word of God. Kodesh Koshim, the holiest of holies. Again, we're referencing things in Exodus. So this sounds very familiar. This sounds a lot like what we saw in Exodus 39.30 with holy holiness to the Lord. These two locations aren't that far apart. So Hebrew inscriptions can be found in two areas written on by Native Americans. What's going on? So you find it once. Okay, sure, you've got a one-off. You find it twice and they don't teach you in school. That is a conspiracy. Cherokee history. Needham departed with a guide nicknamed Indian John, while Arthur stayed in Choda to learn the Cherokee language. On his journey, Needham argued with Indian John, who killed him. Indian John tried to encourage his people to kill Arthur too, but the chief prevented this. Disguised as a Cherokee, 
Arthur accompanied the Chota chief on the raids of Spanish settlements in Florida. Indian communities on the southeast coast and Shawnee towns on the Ohio River. Remember, we found stuff in Ohio too. So now we're finding things that are connected to the Cherokee in Florida. And a lot of people know the Cherokee are in Florida. There's a whole tribe, chief, everything in Florida. So it looks like we can kind of see the direction that people are migrating. For many, Cherokee, Florida, was a safe haven and offered promise of a new start on life. However, it was not, the state was not, uh, with, not without its dangers. From 1690 to 1740, the Cherokee suffered the Great Death, where half the tribe died due to war and disease brought by European invaders. Sounds like a genocide. So let's look at these three locations. Newark, Ohio, Bat Creek, Tennessee, Bat Creek, Tennessee, the Smithsonian said that this was the Cherokee language until they figured out, oh, it's actually Hebrew. And then to the south, we have the Cherokee in Florida. You can kind of see what the route is now. So the question is, did they come from the north or did they come from the south? Next on the map, we're going to look at Las Lunas, New Mexico. Another historical wonder was found in Las Lunas, New Mexico. The Las Lunas Decalogue Stone. And if you guessed it, Decalogue, you remember when we looked at the last location, that was the Ten Commandments. So what do you think the stone has on it? The Ten Commandments. Wow, the United States sure has an interesting history of Native Americans leaving behind the Ten Commandments in Hebrew all over the place. The Las Lunas inscription is an abridged version of the Decalogue or Ten Commandments, carved into the flat face of a large boulder resting on the side of a hidden mountain near Las Lunas, New Mexico, about 35 miles south of, Albu of Albuquerque. The language is Hebrew, and the script is the Old Hebrew alphabet with a few Greek letters mixed in. Maybe historians didn't want to tell you about this stuff because they already had a version of history that they were teaching. And of course, if you start to show all this Hebrew being taught by the or being written by the Native Americans, that really puts a twist in your history that you're depicting to children in school. But of course, this was long before the public education system was even made. So if the public education system was kind of at full steam by 1930, how come these discoveries in the 1800s and 1700s never made it into that curriculum? I guess it wasn't popular enough. In 1996, Professor James D. Tabor of the Department of Religious Studies, University of North Carolina, Charlotte, interviewed the late Professor Frank Hibben, 1910 to 2002, a retired University of New Mexico archeologist who is convinced that the inscription is ancient and thus authentic. He reports that he first saw the text in 1933. At the time it was covered with lichen and panation and was hardly visible. He was taken to the site by a guide who had seen it as a boy back in the 1880s. At present, the inscription itself is badly chalked and scrubbed up. However, Morehouse compares the surviving weathering on the inscription to that on a nearby modern graffito dating itself to 1930. He concludes that the Decalogue inscription is clearly many times older than this graffito and that 500 to 2000 years would not be an unreasonable estimate of its age. So now look at look at the map here. And we haven't, even, we haven't looked at them all yet. So we found the Ten Commandments in Las Lunas, New Mexico. We found the Ten Commandments and the Keystone in Newark, Ohio. We found the Bat Creek Decalogue, the Bat Creek Stone. So again, Ten Commandments, or sorry, sorry, holy, holiness to the Lord. That's Exodus 3930. And the Smithsonian Museum said this was of the Cherokee. And then south in Florida, we found the Cherokee. The inscription uses the Greek tau, zeta, delta, eta, and kappa reversed in place of their Hebrew counterparts, ta, zion, daleth, heth, and kaf, indicating a Greek influence, as well as a post-Alexandrian date despite the archaic form of the aleph that's used. The letters yod, kof, and the flat bottom shin have a distinctly 
Samaritan form. Samaritan form. Suggesting the inscription may be Samaritan in origin. Okay, so let me get this straight. We've got a stone that was written on by Native Americans, but yet it's coming from Samaria because that's where that type of text is coming from. How did it get all the way here to North America? Why didn't they tell us? Samaria is way over here. Remember, that's the Northern Kingdom. And what do we learn about the Northern Kingdom? The Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom, everyone, they were told by Moses, if you keep these laws, statute, and commandments, you'll be blessed. If you don't, you'll be cursed. And we already proved what happened to the Northern Kingdom. Well, the Assyrians conquered it. Where did the Assyrians take them? Into Assyria, and there was different routes. Is that just some story in the Bible? No, the British Museum has this big rock bust that came out of one of the temples. So this is history. So now what we're seeing is Samaria, which was scattered into parts of Assyria, somehow their writings are showing up in North America. And for some reason, even though this happened in the 1800s, we made these discoveries, nobody thought to tell us in school. How are Native Americans writing in a Hebrew found in Samaria, in, in Samaria. This doesn't sound like they are native to America at all. National Geographic, 2013. Great surprise. Native Americans have West Eurasian origins. Oldest human genome reveals less of an East Asian ancestry than thought. That's interesting because... I was taught how the Native Americans got here was across this land bridge called the Bering Strait. That's what they taught us in school. But here in 2013, we've got an update. Now because of DNA, we're able to tell what? They don't really have much of a connection to Asia. So even though there's some similarities in facial features, DNA has a different story. They're actually from Eurasia. National Geographic. Nearly one third of Native American genes come from West Eurasian people linked to the Middle East and Europe. What? Nearly one third of Native American genes come from the West Eurasian people linked to Middle East and Europe, rather than entirely from East Asians as previously thought. Hmm, your land bridge theory is falling apart. According to a newly sequenced genome, DNA. So the question is, where is Eurasia? They gave us a bit of a hint. They said Europe. They said the Middle East. But I don't see Eurasia on a map anymore. Let's look at some old maps. So here we are. We can see here's Eurasia. It looks like it's just beside Europe. It's kind of like Mesopotamia or above Mesopotamia a bit. And then it kind of goes into Russia. Okay. And if we look beneath, you can kind of see I put an arrow there where it says Israel. This is where Israel would be. And beneath this, it's colored in blue. But Africa, you can see, is right beneath it. Here's another map to help you see Eurasia. It's pretty big. It's a lot bigger than I knew. But to make it even more clear, that whole continent, Asia and Europe combined, this was all Eurasia. So Israel technically is a part of Eurasia. So then if you're telling me that the Native Americans, they came from Eurasia according to National Geographic and DNA. And if you want to fight this, remember this. We put people in jail today based on DNA. So you have to accept this. The Native Americans in the United States, at least the Cherokee, they have connections to Eurasia. These people are not native to America. They're not even from America. How could you possibly call them a Native American? Maybe because they were there before the Europeans came, but they're not from there, and their language proves it. They may not speak it now, but their language before that they left behind proved it. Who are you really? What is history hiding about you? Deuteronomy 33, 20 to 21, the tribe of Gad. And Gad, he said, blessed be he, that enlargeth Gad, he dwelleth as a lion, and teareth the arm with the crown of the head. And he provided the first part for himself, because there, in a portion of the lawgiver, was he seated. And he came with his heads of the people, 
He executed the justice of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. Let's break this down a bit because this is a little bit complex. So tribe of Gad, what's that? Well, it's one of the brothers, right? It's one of these 12 children. So Jacob or Israel, this is one of Israel's sons. Gad was one of Israel's sons. Let's look at a different translation. Here's the English Standard Version. And Gad, he said, blessed be he who enlarges Gad. Gad crouches like a lion. He tears off arm and scalp. Okay, wait a minute. Scalp. Gad tears off people's scalps? The tribe of Gad was known for scalping their enemies. Who do you think the tribe of Gad is? How do you think the Hebrew letters got here? Why do you think they're not telling you? Deuteronomy 32 and 20. And Gad, he said, blessed be he that enlargeth Gad. He dwelleth as a lion. If you look at Ellicott's commentary for English readers, beneath this verse, it says, he dwelleth as a lion. See Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 12 and 8. For 11 Gadites whose faces were as lions. Let's look at Chronicles. First Chronicles 12 and 8. Some Gadites defected to David at his stronghold in the desert. They were mighty men of valor, trained for battle, experts with the shield and spear, whose faces were like the faces of lions and who were as swift as gazelles on the mountains. Okay, so these people had shields. They had spears. They had faces that had this look that reminded you of a lion and they were swift on the mountains faces like lions I wonder who that could be so we have individuals that are described being from gad they scalped people they had faces like lions spears and then we have native americans who aren't native to america national geographic they told you they came from eurasia eurasia is technically israel that's a part of it and we know that there was a north kingdom where the Gadites were, and they were scattered. Wasn't there a curse in Deuteronomy that said, if you do what the Lord asks and keep the laws and statutes and commandments, you'll be blessed. If you don't, what will you experience? Genocide, slavery, you'll be scattered. Numbers 1538. Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. Fringes. What are fringes? They had to put fringes on their clothing? Ah, fringes. Numbers 15 and 38. So scalping people, spears, fringes, lion-like faces, people that came from Eurasia that are not native to America, figure it out. They spoke Hebrew. Somebody lost their identity and they replaced it with a different one. But who then were these pioneers? A much earlier wave of Mongoloids? Or another race altogether? Clues to the identity of the first Americans are emerging in rock shelters in the northeast and southeast of Brazil. Archaeologists have recently unearthed human remains. Prehistoric skulls were found buried in layers of soil, nine to twelve thousand years old. They are the oldest skulls in the Americas. And this is the oldest of them all. The skull of a young woman, nicknamed Luthia by scientists. Can she tell us who the first Americans were? Walter Nevis is a physical anthropologist at Sao Paulo University in Brazil. He 
has been using a standard and reliable archaeological measure, the shape of the skull, to find out what race she belonged to. He fully expected Luthier to be a mongoloid, an ancestor of the American Indians. But then he fed the measurements into the computer. When we start running the computer and uh, seeing the results, uh, it was amazing because we realized that uh, uh, the statistics, the quantitative analysis we were doing was not showing just people to be mongoloid. In fact, the analysis was showing just people was anything except mongoloid. Who then was Luthia? And where did she come from? find out, the skull was taken to a hospital in Rio de Janeiro to begin the process of reconstructing her face. The first stage was to perform a three-dimensional CAT scan of Luthia's skull in order to build a replica. was then given to Richard Neave of the University of Manchester and one of the world's leading forensic artists to recreate her features. face that has all the features that you associate with a negroid face. The um, proportions of the face, it doesn't say anything about it being a mongoloid. To get to that point, you need to step back a point. Um, the hardest part I've seen in my fight, and, and I'm the chief of the tribe, is when you come up against people of color as well as European descent and you say Indians, they're looking for the Bill Cody, um, Long Range of Tonto style thing. And when you actually show them that the indigenous people were actually my color, as I have a habit of telling people, a cocoa brown, mm -hmm. or a brown piece of leather well put together. Um, I have a lot of ways of using slangs to tell people that we are still here because we were not weak. We were here before DeSoto and Christopher Columbus, we have to be strong to make it through those um, disasters. During Katrina, I told them Katrina was not a Category 5. My people had to came through some Category 5s, and we survived them. So Katrina, to me, was going to be an easy thing to survive. Because when you're hit by, been hit by a category uh, named DeSoto, Category 5, and it lingers around for four to 500 years, steady beating on the shore, and it just won't move, um, that's a disaster. Not a disaster that just come and go, but a disaster that's still lingering. Then when you have a person like um, George Washington, a des um, that was a category five. He hit and you're still lingering because he's still on shore, <laughs> okay? So that's two categories sitting on shore at the same it's time. It's a God-given right, okay? A God-given right. Because even the people that's in churches of whatever race, they keep singing about the 12 tribes of Israel. But they keep singing about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody didn't come from Jacob. That's right. And if they did, that mean everybody ought to be black. Because Jacob was marrying within his tribe. People that looked like him. He married his uncle's children. Okay? So, when we sit in here, we won't even tell the truth about what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob look like. So then I have to go to mine, like I told this caller that come from you, how far back you think they've been stealing our color and race? Hmm. And, and, and do you think they're gonna get a real people back 
their race. No, that's something we have to stand on. for an intermission i'm just going to mention the fact that in the documentary they said nine to twelve thousand years was the age of the skull impossible remember we're talking about the bible here we already looked at the dates we saw when they came into israel we saw when they came into canaan we saw when they did the exodus was 1500 bc no scholar will deny that it was around that time frame okay well here's the problem the tribe of gad would have been born twelve thousand years ago so maybe when we hear these different documentaries, they talk about things like Ice Age and dinosaurs billions and billions of years ago, maybe we should take the Bible over what they're saying. Because we're noticing that more and more and more we find, when we start to look into things like DNA, what do we notice? The history they describe and the science they describe doesn't quite add up with reality. Exodus 3.14, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, that shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Moses, when he met God as the burning bush, when the Lord appeared to him in the burning bush, he asked the Lord, how am I supposed to tell the people in Egypt to come and follow? How will they know that I've actually spoken to the Lord? And the Lord said, tell them my name. And this is the first time in the Bible that God gives his name. Remember, Lord is a title. Here we're getting a name. And he says, his name is, I am that I am. Tell the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. We got to read this in the Hebrew. Exodus 3.14 in Hebrew, we can see God is Elohim. And then once we get down to the name, it says, Ea, Asher, Ea. So I am who I am, to be or not to be, like William Shakespeare. Now you know what Shakespeare was talking about, to be or not to be. I am who I am. I am also means to be. So you could say I am or to be, it's it's like a synonym. But to be or not to be, I am who I am. We now know what William Shakespeare was talking about all along, which was, is it the God of the Bible or is it not? That's simply what he was asking. If you understand Shakespeare, that was what the famous quote was. Is it the God of the Israelites or is it not? But here's the interesting part. Since we've noticed that the tribe of Gad had these very distinct properties, scalping people, lion-like faces, Spears, shields, tassels. Now we see the name. Is there any remnant left with the people of Gad where that name still exists with them? Yes, and they don't even realize it. When they will dance, they say the name over and over and over again. Aya, 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 aya. Now you know where that came from. It's still within their memory. They still remember the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God that obviously they turned their backs on because now they got involved with spirit worship, totem worship, shamanic kind of worship. And this is something forbidden. And what did we read in Deuteronomy? If you worship other gods and you turn your back on the Lord, you will be cursed. You have to keep the laws and statutes that were given to Moses, all of them. And they still had the Ten Commandments. They had them in Mexico. They had them on this Decalogue stone with Moses right on it. That's crazy. Let's remind ourselves what it said. Deuteronomy 28 and 15, curses for disobedience. If, however, you do not obey the Lord your God carefully by following some of his commandments, no, 
all of his commandments and statutes I'm giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. We didn't look at all of them, but let's just look at some of them. Just as it pleased the Lord to make you prosper and multiply, so it will also please him to annihilate you and destroy you. And you will be uprooted from the land you are entering to possess. So they hadn't made it into the land of Canaan yet. But once they were in that land, if they decided that they were going to go sideways and do what the surrounding nations were going to do, what was going to happen? God would destroy them. He would uproot them. He would scatter them. The Lord will scatter you among all the nations from one end of the earth to the other. And there you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone. I repeat that. Gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your fathers have known. Deuteronomy 28, 63 and 64, curses for disobedience. Just as it pleased the Lord to make you prosper and multiply, it will also please him to annihilate you and destroy you. Look at 64. The Lord will scatter you among the nations from one end of the earth to the other. Eurasia would be the other end of the earth, literally. And if you see here, it says, and there you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone. Excuse me, what is a totem exactly? What is a totem? They say that has to do with spirit worship or spirit animals even. What, what are these spirit animals? Are these these different gods like the coyote god or the coyote spirit or the raven spirit? This is something that's apostate. They had left what their roots were and they've went a totally different direction here. And we see it today. And the funny thing is, what are our leaders doing? Our leaders are supporting it. Their leaders are saying, embrace your native spirituality. Embrace your ancestry. This is not your ancestry. This is what you became after you forgot who you are. And I'll show you in the Bible, it actually said that Jacob, who is Israel, he would forget who he was. But he didn't do it on his own. He had help. And it was in the Bible too. Now you'll understand why these world leaders are really pushing the natives to adopt this spirituality. It's not native to America. They're from Israel. They were captured in Assyria. And I will prove through DNA that that's true. Not like the rock bus wasn't enough. California governor apologizes to Native Americans for genocide. Okay, so we can officially say then there was a Native genocide. But remember, they're from Eurasia. So wasn't it described in Deuteronomy 28 that you'd be scattered, your children would become slaves, they would be killed? That's a genocide. So it looks like that promise in Deuteronomy was true. The scattering was obviously true because you literally did make it to the other side of the earth. This is from NPR, National Press Room. An American secret, the untold story of Native American enslavement. Okay, so if Deuteronomy 28 said you become slaves, well, I guess you became slaves. NPR says so. Thanksgiving. All countries have national myths. The story of the first Thanksgiving, I like how they start this off here, a national myth. Well, then I guess you know what the story of Thanksgiving is. It's a story. For example evokes the warm glow of intercultural contact. European settlers struggling to survive in the new world and Native American tribes eager to help. But as this, sorry, but as many of us learned in history class, this story leaves out a lot. This week on Hidden Brain, we explore an open secret that from the time of Christopher Columbus arrived in the new world until the year 1900, there were as many as 5 million Native people enslaved in America. Thanks, Columbus. We'll talk about this history and the psychological reasons it was left unexamined for so long. It's probably the same psychological reasons it was left un unexamined that we found Native Americans that aren't Native to America leaving Hebrew writings like the Ten Commandments in multiple places in the United States. Is that one of the psychological reasons or is that part of the psychological reason? We also hid Thanksgiving? Probably. Here's a quote by Christopher Columbus, a.k.a. Cristobal Colon. His, name, his real name wasn't Columbus. The Indians are so naive and so free with their possessions that no one who has not witnessed them would believe it. When you ask for something they have, they never say no. To the contrary, they offer to share with anyone. They would make fine servants. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. That's not the Columbus I remember in school. This is the real Columbus. I've read books about Columbus written by some of his men, and it's awful. They were raping the women. 
killing the children. They thought it was hilarious when they came to North America. They would fire a gun in the air. The natives had no idea what it was. And they'd all scurry into the woods. And they're like, look, with one gun, we can make 100 people run away. They thought it was just hilarious. So now you can see the real version of Columbus. And Columbus, he had a different name. It wasn't Christopher Columbus. It probably wasn't even Cristobal Colon. And I will show you from a couple sources, he has multiple names. We don't really know who Columbus is, but I can show you something about Columbus we can prove. This is Encyclopedia Britannica. Five unbelievable facts about Christopher Columbus. Number five, it's not even the best one. Christopher Columbus was not his real name. Although Columbus remains a prominent historical figure around the world and has been researched and written about for centuries, there are many details of his life that are still a mystery. Many scholars agree that he was born in Genoa, which is now a part of Italy, although there are theories that he may have originated in Spain or even in Poland or Greece. In Italian, he is known as Cristoforo Colombo, which was a long line thought to be his birth name, and in Spanish, Cristobal Colon. But he has also been referred to by himself, and I'll show you the signature, and others, as Cristual, Cristovam, Christophorus de Colombo, and even XP Paul du Colon. I'll explain that one because that one has an occult meaning. And I know what it is. There is even a theory that he adopted the name from a pirate named Colombo. That would be extremely fitting because he was a pirate in his actions. Let's just remind ourselves what Deuteronomy 28 taught. The Lord through Moses told the tribes, all of them, not just the Gadites, that if they kept the law, they'd be blessed. The Lord through Moses told the tribes if they broke the law, they'd be cursed. And remember, if the Lord says something, he's not flimsy like we are, he has to do it. So if the word gives you, if the Lord gives you a warning and you break it, he still has to follow through whether he likes it or not. Otherwise, you can't depend on him. If we say that Christ is a God of truth and the Lord is Christ, Christ is Lord, you can't have him flip-flop. He has to make a statement and live it. So he, they were told that they would experience being conquered by other nations. Well, if the Gadites are the Gadites, which they are, were they conquered by Europeans? That would be other nations. They had worship a God of wood and stone. You ever see the Inuit when they stack those stones and they make, for example, it's more, a lot of it in Northern Canada, but I'm going to show you that the people in Northern Canada are the same ones that came from the States. And then, of course, the totems would be the idols of wood. They would experience genocide. Well, we saw that the governor had excused the fact that there was a genocide of the native people in his state, and it wasn't just that one state, and that they'd be taken as slaves. And we saw that as well. So is Deuteronomy true or is Deuteronomy false? Well, assuming the Gadites are the Gadites, and we don't have another group of people from Eurasia speaking Hebrew, it would be true. Shalom, brothers and sisters. My name is Daryl. I'm Yaikwab. We put this video together for our brothers and sisters out there, the tribe of Gad. Um, for me, I want to start out in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, where it is written, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because they have rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. We as a people feel like we have no hope, feel like we're not remembered by our Creator, feel that everything around us is just desperation, living only to survive. and. I look around and see all our young people, all our elders. When we go up before Senate and councils, they sh give us no respect. They break treaties left and right. They write laws that benefit them. They do all these things. And we receive nothing from them. Food stamps, commodities. Um, all these are truths that we know about on these reservations. And these are all curses, which is why we use the book of Deuteronomy and the prophecies that are written in those places. 
And we do not have that knowledge, which is why this video came out, is to give you the knowledge to know that you are better than just being called an Indian, better than just being called an Apache, a Navajo, a Sioux, and all these other cursed names that we were being given. And by calling myself an Apache, I call myself an enemy, but I don't know who is my enemy. Now I've come to that realization that my enemy are those who have given me the name Apache, who have taken away the inheritance that was given to us. And the reason why this inheritance was taken away from us is because we started doing abominations in front of the Most High as far as setting up the crown dancers and saying that they are holy to us setting up kachinas saying that they they are our gods when we started doing things like this it provoked the most high to anger and we all know that the scripture says that god is a jealous god so if we have provoked him to jealousy would he not chastise us would he not rebuke us would he not tell us that everything we're doing is wrong and that we are sinning against him? Because there have been men who have been raised up to fight for us and who have warned us of things to come, but we have not listened. That you open up your ears and open up your heart to this word is because it's our word before it ever came into the white man's hands. Israel is not a state, it was a group of people who are dark-skinned. Israel is not a state, it was a group of people, and he says dark-skinned. That's funny because that's exactly what they were looking at when they were examining those skulls. They said these are mongreloids, these are Negroes, meaning that they were black. So that would mean that a portion of the native community, if not all, at least a portion, is black. And when you look at people that are very close to their original bloodline, they didn't go out and mix with the French or English or whatever the case was, you'll notice that their features are much, much, much darker, Cherokee especially. And the Cherokee tribal chief said, I'm black. When Europeans see me, they think of this thing from the Lone Ranger in Tonto, but that's not who we are. That's a false depiction that they made. So it's funny, they kept this information out of schools and they had it for over 100 years. And then you have people come to the realization, we're part of these 12 tribes in the Bible. What do you think is going on in Mexico? The same thing. As a matter of fact, we'll study this on a different day. But if you want to know who the Mexicans are, if you read about the other children in the Bible and the symbols that were behind them when they were gained their blessings, what you heard about one child is one child was described as having a wet back and being connected to the symbol of a donkey. If that isn't any more clear in regards to could this possibly be the tribe that's in Mexico today? I'll let you research and figure out what it is. There's a bunch of tribes that are missing today. And today we pretend that Israel is all just in Palestine. It's ridiculous. Israel was a people that was scattered. And the funniest part is when you go to places you call third world or reservations in this case, the people in these third world places, a lot of times they're mixed in with Israel. So you're actually being waited on by people who at one point were God's chosen people. You see, the mistranslation is this. A lot of people say, well, the Jews are God's chosen people. Jews just comes from Judah. But in the Bible, it didn't say the Jews are God's chosen people. It said Israel, the Israelites, the 12 tribes are God's chosen people. And they all sin. And we saw this in the Old Testament multiple times. They worship the Baals. They worship the Asherahs. I mean, today we have things like Mother's Day. It's all connected. And people look at this stuff like it's no big deal. Well, hey, for the originals, the people that were connected to Abraham, it's a huge deal because they have to be cursed. They had God revealed to their ancestors. God said, I'm a jealous God. Do not worship these other gods. They're false gods. They're not even good gods. If you read in the book of Psalms 82, you can tell that these gods that people are worshiping, they will eventually someday die like men and men will judge them. In other words, the disciples of Christ, they will judge both men and angels. So tribe of Gad, how did you get to North America? We still haven't figured that out yet. 
well, that's easy. It's the Bering, the Bering Strait. This is what they taught you in school. I'm going to show you. Remember, this is a theory. You need to be very skeptical when you hear the word theory. Theory is not proven. Theory is attached to all kinds of ideas that have existed for hundreds of years with no additional evidence. So if you have multiple theories and people are taught in school just one theory and the documentaries are just teaching you one theory, your mind gets filled with a bunch of stuff that just simply isn't true. It's a theory. Don't make a theory into a reality until you actually have it factually proven. Let's find out the failure of the Bering Strait. I'll give you the first failure. The first failure is this. Since we know that the tribe of Gad are the ones that had the fringes, would scalp people, lion-like faces, et cetera, et cetera, and we found their Hebrew remnants all through the United States, they're not 12,000 years old. You couldn't connect them to this ice land bridge. It's impossible. It chronologically can't happen. But now we're going to find another reason. Here is a world map of why DNA haplogroups. Again, if I can put someone in jail because of DNA, this gets final say. So if you take a look, you can see in the Americas, South America and North America, we see a whole lot of purple. We see the letters Q and the letters R. So in Canada, for example, we can see Q3, Q1, R1B. And then we can see primarily in South America, Q3. So then South America, we have the Qs. North America, we have a mix of Q and R. So it looks like we might have more than one tribe. And I said that it looks like there was more than one migration because we saw old Hebrew letters, but then we also saw more modern Hebrew letters. Let's find out where these DNA haplogroups come from. Haplogroup R1, that was one of them. R1, M173, is predominantly found in North American groups like the Ojibwa, 50 to 79%. Seminole, 50%. Sioux, 50%. Cherokee, 47%. Dogrib, 40%, and excuse my pronunciation, Tohono Odom, Pag, uh, Papago, 38%. So here we're seeing a large amount. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with some of these names, especially in Canada. They're connected to this R1 haplogroup. Well, where's R1 coming from? Let's take a look at the map. So we see R1A, R1B. Okay, so these are slight fluctuations off of R1, but where is it showing up? Let's look at where Israel is. We can see Israel where the golden arrow is. And then what happened? We saw there was an Assyrian captivity where the northern part of Israel was pulled towards the north and towards the east. Can you see it based on DNA? I know you can. So obviously, like we saw this rock bust, it's totally true. DNA, smoking gun. Here's your smoking gun. Cherokee DNA. Its scientists have labeled the Cherokees not as Native Americans because they're not from America but as Middle Eastern, North African population. Remember, when the Second Temple was destroyed, where do those people go? Well, if you're a dark-skinned person, where are you going to hide from the Romans? Africa. So if we take a look at this map, we can see R1B. R1B is showing up in Europe, also in Spain, and which is right above Africa. Do we have any history to prove? that there were Jews in Spain? Yeah, they're called the Moranos. And then we can also see some other haplogroups mixed in here, like the Berbers. Here's an article. This is from ResearchGate. So this is a scholarly article. It says, possible African origin of Y chromosome R1, M173. That's the one we were just looking at. So then the Cherokee, they're black. They're not Asian. Asian is where you're getting the word mongoloid from, Mongolia, the Mongols. Great surprise. Remember National Geographic? Native Americans have West Eurasian origins. Oldest human genome, DNA, reveals less of an East Asian ancestry than thought. Of course, it's not an East Asian ancestry. These are the Gadites. They came from above Jerusalem. There was the Northern Kingdom and Judea. And then they got shipped out, obviously, to where? Assyria. We saw it on the map. We could see that their DNA was going through parts of Europe. It was also going through towards the east north, or northeast, sorry, where Assyria is. Nineveh, for example. Cherokee, unlike other Indians. DNA consultants. DNA consultants. Let me just point something out. The word Indian 
Indian is actually a name that Columbus was associating to the people coming from India. So we're talking the Indus Valley, India as in Asia, India. That area, when Columbus had traveled and found North America, he had confused the people that were living in North America for being India. He thought he actually arrived in India. He didn't even realize where he was. That's why we apply the word Indian to people living in the West. And it's a derogatory term that shouldn't be used at all. They're not Indians. They're Gadites. R1B, and there's another haplotype, J1C7. I have been tracing this genome out of where? Out of Africa to see the migration lineage. And yes, the markers are dot, dot, dot. Yes, the markers are there. You can read tons of articles about this. This is all new science that we're not getting the update on, but I can assure you government knows. Haplogroup QM3, that was the other group we saw. We saw the Qs, right? All that purple color. Haplogroup QM3 is one of the Y chromosome haplogroups linked to the indigenous people of the Americas. Over 90% of indigenous people in Meso and South America. But we saw that because when we look at this graph, or the, sorry, this chart, we can see all of South America. It's all purple, it's all QM3. So Q3, and if we look up, clearly they made their way into Canada. But if we look at the Bering Strait, sure, we see a little bit of purple, but let's think about this for a second. If you took a gigantic tribe of people, women, children, elderly, all these people, and they're on foot, maybe a couple had animals, whatever, is it more realistic if we were gonna travel from location A to location B and there's four stops in between? The bulk would be at location A, okay? We'll, we'll, we'll call our locations A, B, C, and D. The bulk would be at location A. Maybe once we reach location B, people see, hey, there's a nice lake here, there's some nice trees, there's hunting for us. Okay, some of us are gonna stop here and we're gonna live here. Then the rest carry on and they go to location C. Hey, there's some, some nice stuff here. My legs are tired. My wife's tired. The, you know, my grandparents are tired. Let's just stop here and we'll live here. And then location D is going to funnel out to have the least amount of people. So when you look at this Bering Strait theory, it's insane. Because one, it defies genetics. But secondly, on top of that, do you really think that the bulk of people came from Asia, walked across a land bridge that predates the tribe of Gad for that matter, and then went all the way through Canada, all the way through the United States, and then down to South America where the bulk of them resided, that is backwards. That doesn't make any sense. So obviously the migration wasn't from the north to the south. It was from the south to the north. And we already saw when we looked at the Ten Commandments and the other pieces that were left behind, the Cherokee were in Florida. Then we also see the Smithsonian Museum said, well, the Cherokee left this behind and it looks like it's their writing. No, it's Hebrew and it's upside down. In Italian, he is known as Cristoforo Colombo. So now we're looking at Columbus again, because I'm going to show you something funny about him. You want to see how history is written by the victors? You wonder why you were programmed to believe that this was such a great guy when there's so many books. All you had to do was research, out, research outside of high school and research outside of elementary school, and you would have found tons of books. I've read them myself where he did the most horrible of things. And these aren't books written by people in the 20th century. These are written by some of his crew. They were ashamed. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you know this, after Columbus's first voyage to North America, when he came back, he brought native slaves with him. In other words, he brought Israelites with him back to Spain. The people in Spain, they didn't agree with Columbus. They were normal. They said, take them back. What are you doing? This is sick. They're not gonna be our slaves. So Columbus literally brought people after his first voyage back to Spain, and the Spanish said, take them back. You'll notice here, here's Columbus, one of the more famous pictures, painting. Here, if we take a look, this is how Columbus signed his name. If you don't think his name was Cristobal Colon, well, he signed his name like that. But I'm not even interested in the Cristobal Colon. Anyone can figure that one out. I'm interested in this bottom signature. You see, this bottom signature would have a meaning to someone that was in the mystery schools, the secret societies, the occult, the mystery religion of Babylon. Notice the name here has like an X and a P. If you study this, or you might know this if you're a Roman Catholic, it's called the Chi Rho. The Chi Rho is one of the earliest forms of the Christogram. So Chi and Rho. So Chi is X and Rho is P. So if you ever see in Roman Catholic churches or artwork or Constantine, which we're going to cover shortly, you will see this XP, Windows XP. wonder where they got the idea for that. XP. The Chi Rho is one of the earliest forms of the Christogram. 
formed by superimposing the first two letters, chi and rho, of the Greek. Wait a minute, didn't we just read from the Britannica that um, Christopher Columbus, or whatever name he wants to go by, was possibly from Greece? Well, this is a Greek thing. And if you notice here in Greek, it says XP and then the rest. This is supposed to be the word Christ. In such a way that the vertical stroke of the rho intersects with the center of the P. Okay, so P goes through the X. Remember that. P goes through the X. This is funny because this looks a lot like the pharmacy symbol. The PX could easily be misconstrued for an RX. The Chi Rho, the symbol of the Savior's name. Two Greek letters to signify the name of Christ. So was Columbus signing his name in regards to saying he believed in Christ? Or was Columbus signing his name saying, I am Christ? Because I've already showed you. There's a bunch of people in history who had this crazy idea that they were gods, but yet they were men. And the Bible talks about it quite a bit. And the serpent in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, remember, you will be like God. And then we saw in Genesis 4.26, an interesting mistranslation that can only be seen in the original 1611 King James Bible, where for whatever reason they wrote in the side notes, it's not that we proclaim the name of the Lord in Genesis 4.26, the Hebrew word was shalal, which can also be translated as defile or pollute or profane. And of course, when King James had the translation done in the crib notes, it said people started to call themselves by the name of the Lord. Well, that would be an idol. So the chiro would be a symbol of people who call themselves by the name of the Lord. Remember, Christ is Lord. The same Lord of the Old Testament was Christ of the New Testament. It says the military symbol used by Constantine in hoc signo vinces. This came from Constantine. That's where the symbol comes from. It's not a biblical symbol. It's a symbol that Constantine came up with. And it means in this sign, you shall conquer. In the name of Christ or the name of something else. They signed their name with XP because they believe that they themselves are gods. And we saw in the Eastern religions, what did we find about the Eastern religions? Well, for example, the word yoga, when we checked the Upanishads, what was the word yoga all about? Well, yoga was all about reaching a self-realization where you believe you have a God within. Or in this case, you have a Christ within. They're signing their name with XP because they believe that they are Christ. They are lords, gods. It's funny, in Britain, in Britain, don't people call each other lords? It's a title, is it not? How about this? This is from Mystic Masonry. You've all seen it before. Mystic Masonry by J.D. Buck. Freemasonry. In the early church, as in the secret doctrine, there was not one Christ for the whole world, but a potential Christ in every man. Theologians first made a fetish of the impersonal, omnipresent divinity, and then tore the Christos from the hearts of all humanity in order to deify Jesus, that they might have a God-man peculiarly of their own. In other words, what are the Masons teaching? They're teaching that you're all God. You're all God. It's not that there was one Jesus. He was a God, sure, but we are all gods. And that's what Columbus believed. And that's what that XP symbol means. This is a Roman Catholic symbol for Christ. Or no, it's actually the God man. Christ didn't have long hair. This is Tammuz. This is what was being spoken of in the book of Ezekiel. These are people that face towards the east when they do worship. Both the Masonic Hall and St. Peter's Basilica are oriented so that you face the east. This is in representation of the sun or the God-man. They don't see Christ as the sun, S-O-N. They see Christ as the sun, S-U-N. You cannot read the book of Ezekiel and come to the conclusion that God is the sun, S-U-N. And you cannot read the book of Deuteronomy and come to the conclusion that God is the sun, S-U-N. Impossible. This is the occult. This is from the Knights of Columbus. Christopher Columbus in fake history. Knights of Columbus. Born in Genoa, Italy, Columbus was a deeply Catholic explorer. Well, if this symbol, the XP, came from Constantine, and we have Columbus who was a deep Catholic explorer, well, then it would make sense where the symbol came from. Who was he commissioned to go overseas and discover the new land for? The church. Of course, if we read about Queen Isabel and King Ferdinand in Spain, where Columbus was, they didn't have money. They didn't have enough money to send Columbus over the sea. 
he had to get that money from a group of people living in Spain called the Moranos. They were Jews that were living in Spain. Rare ancient Roman Christian religious silver ring artifact, the Chiro, the XP, the Christ. This is a Roman symbol. This is not biblical. There's nothing biblical to explain this aside from the fact that when you write Christ in Greek, you'll see these letters. But this symbol where it's intersecting, notice the P is intersecting the X. This is Roman. This symbol originated with Constantine. Here's a coin. There's Constantine's head. Constantine's head. On the back of it, what do you see? Ah, the XP. And then in hoc signo vinces. In this sign we conquer. Well, if we're not talking about the Christ of the Bible, we must be talking about a different Christ. I wonder if it's the same thing as the Masonic Christ, which is the Christ within. Did Constantine not want to get baptized because he believed in the Bible, but at a different perspective? Did Constantine think that he was a god? Did Constantine maybe have some influence from the cult of Mithra? In hoc signo vinces, Constantine, the historian, the Bishop of Eusebius of Caesarea, states that Constantine was marching with his army. And just so you know, if you want to read anything about Constantine, you have to read the works of Eusebius. Eusebius was a contemporary. He existed at the same time as Constantine. No one else has wrote about Constantine that lived at the same time as Constantine. So this is your best source. So Eusebius says that Constantine was marching with his army. Eusebius does not specify the actual location of the event, but it is clearly not in the camp at Rome. When he looked up where? He looked up to the sun and saw a cross of light above it. And with it, the Greek words, in this sign we conquer, in hoc signo vinces. This is where this comes from. So then Constantine looked at the sun when he came up with the symbol of the XP, the Chiro. Interesting. So on the left, these are the Knights Templar. These are the Masons. We have two sons. But you notice there's a cross going through a crown. I wonder if that's the same thing as a P going through the X. And if you look on the right-hand side, this is the Jesuit order. Now, there's a difference between the two. One son is the black son. The other son is just the son. Do you think there'd be a difference between the black sun and the sun? You see, if I turn on a light, that would be like the sun. The light exposes the shadow. But what would a black sun do? A black sun would cast darkness. So if I had to look between these two symbols, who would be telling the truth and who would be a liar? The one on the right would be a liar. The one on the left would likely be telling the truth. Here's the funny part. With the Jesuits... We've studied them before, and they were kicked out of three, or sorry, 70 countries in less than 300 years. I've never heard of a group being kicked out of so many places, and countries were starting to get wise to them. They realized the Jesuit colleges are what they were using to prime students, bring them into their guild, and then they were obviously disrupting society. And eventually they started closing down these colleges, kicking out the Jesuits, and suddenly things in these countries got better. Now we're in a very interesting situation. We've got the first Jesuit Pope, Pope Francis, and he has this symbol on his coat of arms. And as Pope Francis came to power, a lot of weird things started happening in the world. A lot of strange things with gender. And the funny thing was the Pope before him, he didn't agree with any of it. Pope Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, he didn't agree with any of the stuff that this new Pope agrees with, but he wasn't a Jesuit. And it's interesting that Pope Benedict, or sorry, uh, Pope, um, not Benedict, uh, Pope Francis. Pope Francis has made some pretty radical changes to the Catholic Church, some pretty new things in regards to tolerance. And when I see the symbol of the black sun, I think to myself, are you just casting shadow? Are you turning things upside down? Are you and your colleagues deceiving? Ezekiel 8, 15 and 16, son of man, he said to me, do you see this? Yet you will see even greater abominations than these. Ooh, what's the abomination? So he brought me to the inner court of the house of the Lord. And there at the entrance to the temple of the Lord, between the portico and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs to the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east. 
and they were bowing down to the east in worship of the sun. Well, both these groups, their temples are facing the east. St. Peter's Basilica was built to orient towards the east when the Catholic Mass is done. All the congregation faces the east. In the Masonic Hall, we've seen the diagram. You see, the tabernacle of Moses, which became the Solomon's Temple, the people were oriented so they would face the west. In the west was the holiest of holies. Why? Because the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was, where God would manifest and sit there for the high priest to communicate with him through a veil, that was westward. But yet these two groups with the same symbol, slightly different, one's dark, one's light, they face the east. So when that movie came out, Macaulay Culkin called The Good Son, one had blonde hair, he was the bad one. One had dark hair, he was the good one. I kind of wonder if that was a play on this idea, the twin sons. You ever hear the term two wrongs don't make a right? One is obviously the lesser of two evils because one is at least trying to expose the other one. But that's why you'll look and you'll see, hey, they do similar symbols, similar gestures. I mean, if we have IHS with the Knights Templar and IHS with the Jesuits, let me point something out. The Catholic Church was the ones who put an end to the Knights Templar. They burned Jacques, Jacques Demolay at the stake. How could you possibly say that they're friends? As a matter of fact, we've looked at the war that was going on between Protestants and Catholics and how there was a lot of Masonic influence on the Protestant side. And when the Jesuits wrote their writings, their secret doctrines that they didn't want anyone to see, they made these very evil comments about what they had planned for individuals that were Protestants or Masons. They treated them the same. And it's despicable. It's violent. In hoc signo vinces, Columbus was part of a solar death cult. This is solar symbolism. This is not Christ symbolism. Christ didn't, Christ didn't condone the Crusades. If you think the Crusades were condoned by God, then tell me why they didn't win. I mean, they had all these Crusades where they just kept losing the Holy Land. If this was something where God wanted the people to win, well, then they would have won. I mean, when we look at the Israelites in the Old Testament, they had a lot less than the Knights Templar, or sorry, than the uh, Knights Templar and the Crusaders and the Teutonic Knights from Germany. They had much, much less, but they still conquered their enemies. These Europeans could not take the Arabs away from the Temple Mount. They tried and tried and tried and tried and failed. Obviously, God was not supporting this. So don't pretend like the Crusades had anything to do with the Bible. That was just people with egos. Now, here's something interesting about Columbus. A painting will tell you a lot because paintings, you got to pose for a long time. Look at Columbus's hand. He's making kind of like a W or an M symbol. And if we look at this old postcard, it says, are you a Mason? And the guy is waving with his two fingers together. Now, am I implying that Columbus is a Mason? Absolutely not. But I'm saying that they're using the same symbols. We already saw that with the Knights Templar versus the Jesuits. We see a dark sun and a sun. So, of course, you're going to see some overlap with the symbols. I kind of wonder if the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit was actually alluding to this as well. Here is the U.S. National Library of Medicine. I'm like, this is a weird article to find in here. 2019, December, secret hand gestures and paintings. Oh. Here's one picture. Look at this. Look at the hand of Christ. Are you sure this is Christ? Christ wasn't supposed to wear red and blue. I mean, the priests were primarily blue, the high priest at least. And then also notice the long hair. I thought long hair was an abomination. But here's the elephant in the room. What are you doing with your hand? And that's right out of this article. Again, U.S. National Library of Medicine. Why is this even in here? Here's another example, but this time it's a female. And we've been studying this male-female god that was worshipped in the East. We saw the Black Madonna, for example. But notice this. Again, there's that weird hand symbol. Clearly, this is intentional. This is no accident. How about this one? This is very similar. I think it was Michelangelo that painted this. It's either Da Vinci or Michelangelo. Don't quote me, but it's one of the two. Notice this symbol of God, which we found out was the brain in other paintings. It represents the brain, and we saw the pineal gland. But look at the hand. This is supposed to be God. Well, here's the problem. Where in the Bible does it say that God is a man with a beard? Read Exodus and read it carefully. God is not depicting himself as an old man with a beard. Zeus, on the other hand, might look like this. Is that what was being painted? But interestingly enough, look at the hand symbol. And who is Zeus? 
Well, Zeus was the Greek god. Jupiter was his Roman name. And Jupiter is Baal, Baal. That's Old Testament. means Lord, right? So I guess the question is, which Lord do you worship? Do you worship this Lord? The Lord that has long hair like a hippie? This Lord, the male, female? This Lord, the one that doesn't match the descriptions of the Bible that people in the mystery schools were drawing in their paintings? That the crypto, actually, we'll get to that in just a second, that Columbus was depicting with his own hand. How about this? Same hand gesture? Obviously, it means something. Let me show you what it has to do with. According to this hypothesis, the gesture was a secret hand sign used to recognize, look at this, crypto Jews. So the gesture was a secret hand sign used to, used to recognize crypto Jews to each other. During the time of the Inquisition, according to the Catholic King's Order of 1492, Jews living in the Iberian Peninsula, that's Spain, were forced to accept or leave Spain. In other words, in Spain, they said, you can either convert and become a Christian. You're not going to be Jews anymore. You're not going to have your own little religion. This is all one teaching. The Old Testament and New Testament are one book. You're not just going to follow the Old Testament and do something separate and say that this is called Judaism. They were challenged in Spain and said, look, you can either accept being a Christian or you can leave. Take your pick. So then what happened was we started to see that people who decided they were no longer going to, Jews that decided they were not going to abide by this, they started using secret hand symbols they could identify each other. So that way, even if they said outwardly, I'm a Christian, if they made that hand symbol, you could tell this wasn't Christianity. This was a symbol of mysticism. And we can see it goes all the way back to Ezekiel, Tammuz, and Egypt. Many Jews, although converted, continued to practice Judaism in secret. There it is right there. They said that they converted to being Christians in Spain, but they didn't actually. And they continued to practice Judaism in secret, especially in Judea, which was the old Jewish barrio, neighborhood of Toledo. These last Jews were called crypto-Jews, or this one you might know, Moranos, which means Christianized Jew, swine or pig in medieval Spanish. This was a derogatory term. So this is really interesting. We have this kind of a group that in paintings, they must have been quite powerful because most people, most people don't get a painting made of themselves. So when we see Columbus and all these other individuals making this hand symbol, and we see Jesus, which we know isn't Jesus, making this hand symbol, this is a secret symbol of another religion. This is a crypto Jew. In other words, a Jew in disguise, pretending to be a Christian, but you're not actually a Christian. You're still practicing the occult. And we saw in the Old Testament, the Jews did what? They worshiped the golden calf. They worshiped the Baals. They worshiped the Asherahs. This is the continuation of this. So when you see people like Columbus making this symbol, now you understand what this is really about. Here's Columbus. Here's masonry. Are they the same? No, they are different. One side is the sun, one side is the dark sun. Well, if Columbus went overseas and started enslaving people, raping people, and bringing them back to Spain and the people were disgusted, and then in school, what did we learn? Columbus is a great guy. We should celebrate Columbus Day. Clearly, you can tell who's ruling your nation. Your nation is ruled by the darkness. And so if your nation is coming up with these contradicting ideas, look how far back this goes. I would be very wary if I saw anyone connected to the group on the left that's trying to give you advice today. Because once you start to see where the transatlantic slave, originate, transatlantic slave trade originated from, Columbus, maybe you shouldn't listen to those people. Maybe you should use your own critical thinking and stop relying on people in suits and ties with credibility to tell you what good and bad is. Because maybe they're associated to this left-hand group. It's called the left-hand path. Revelation 2.9, maybe this line should make more sense to you. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are from the synagogue of Satan. Excuse me? So there's Jews operating in the world, according to Revelation 2.9, that are not Jews at all. They're from the synagogue of Satan. Now, a synagogue is a place, obviously, where Jews go to worship. Does that mean that every Jew is part of the synagogue of Satan? No, but it gives you a hint in regards to who it is. It's not Islam. It's not the Chinese. It's a synagogue. So figure it out. It means that there is a portion of people operating within this group, and they're doing things clearly that are unbiblical. 
They're breaking laws, the laws that were given to Moses, the laws and statutes. And look what it says in the first sentence. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. So something having to do with the synagogue of Satan and your poverty go hand in hand. I got a question for you. Who controls the banks? Well, they're European bankers. Get more granular, my friends. Find the answer. Who controls the banks? Who's been printing money just like it can be created out of thin air while you are going more and more into debt because of hyperinflation? Every time they print money, you have less and less money. You just don't see it because hyperinflation is kind of invisible, but your children, your descendants, your offspring, they are suffering because of the hyperinflation that started in Canada in 1974 and started in the United States when they broke the gold standard. Who ever let anyone decide that they could just make human energy? Because that's what money is. At least when it was gold, you had to like find it or refine it or dig for it. Now you just allow someone to say, I can print monopoly money and I have the power, but you can't do it because I'm the boss. Psalms 83, 1 and 8. Now we're going to find out who did it. Who, who's responsible? You can already kind of see. I mean, I've already pointed out some of the details. But the Bible told you in Psalms 83 that this would happen. God. Do not remain silent. Do not turn a deaf ear. Do not stand aloof, O God. See how your enemies growl, how your foes rear their heads. Listen to this. With cunning, they conspire against your people. Who are your people? Israel. Is that just the state of Palestine? No, Israel is 12 tribes. They plot against those you cherish. Come, they say. Let us destroy them as a nation. Here's the most important part that Israel's name is remembered no more. Do you think the people in Canada and the United States, the Native Americans, realize that they're not necessarily from the United States and Canada? Do you think they all know they're from Eurasia? Do you think they all know that their ancestors spoke Hebrew? Do you think that maybe Israel doesn't remember their name anymore? Now, it's not like the Native Americans are all of Israel, but they're definitely some of it. We saw the R1 haplo group is the Cherokee, they're black, and they must have come from Africa somehow. But where were the Jews in Spain? They had to come through Africa, did they not? How do you get to the Iberian Peninsula without coming through Egypt and then working your way through places like Libya and then making your way up into Spain? But there's more. South America, QM3. The Mexicans. The Mexicans, they would be another example. Of course, there's two different types of Mexicans, though. You'll see there's lighter skin and darker skin. How did that happen? Well, didn't the ships come over and colonize? And then all of a sudden you had lighter skinned people that were more Spanishy, the Spanish ships, right? Was it not the Spanish that came into Mexico? That's why you see that the Mexicans have light skin and dark skin. So if you go to Mexico, who's got the better jobs? The light skin or the dark skin? Who's on TV more? The light skin or the dark skin? Who gets to work at the tourist zones? The light skin or the dark skin? Can you see what's going on here? This is awful. And it's because none of us know the Bible. With one mind, they plot together. They form an alliance against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, of Moab and the Hagrites, Byblos, Amun, and Amalek, Philistia, with the people of Tyr. Even Assyria has joined to reinforce Lot's descendants. Lot's descendants. Remember Lot? Lot was this cousin, he, or sorry, the nephew of Abraham, Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember that story? So here we can see that they're connected to Lot's descendants. Well, didn't Lot, didn't he have sex with his daughters? And was it the outcome of having sex with both of his daughters? One was called the Moabites and one was called the Ammonites. Well, they're listed right here. And their God, one of them was Shamash. What was Shamash? A sun god. And now you look in the world and I see all this symbol of sun worship and we just ignore it. It's no big deal. In front of the government building, we've got this big Egyptian obelisk. In front of Washington, D.C., we've got this big Egyptian obelisk. In front of the Vatican Church representing Christ, we've got this big Egyptian obelisk. Don't tell me that these details don't matter. The details don't matter to you. You're ignoring it. And notice I've highlighted these two words, Edom and Ishmael. Now, it's more than Edom and Ishmael, but these ones are easy to point out. If you look here, there's a list of a whole bunch of names. It looks like the whole world was against Israel, or at least a lot of these different places in the Middle East. They were all plotting to do what? Erase the memory, the identity that Israel's Israel. The book of Psalms states that Edom and Ishmael would plot to make Israel forget their identity. 
well, I guess if the Bible's true, I should be able to see something in history to prove that these two people had something to do with Israel forgetting who they are. I think it's really interesting that every single time we find Hebrew artifacts, right? Hebrew writing, and then some indigenous people in a third world. Who's the first person to get over there? We see the Jesuits or the, just the church in general, they come over in their boats and then they colonize. So remember what those two Native American men or Gadites had said? They said the white man took our religion and sold it back to us. I'm sorry, but that's true. That was your book. It's not like this is a book of color. God is not a God that picks white over black. It has nothing to do with that. But historically speaking, yes, the darker skinned people of the world do have a connection to at least some, if not all, of the tribes of Israel. I don't say all, I would say some. So who are the Edomites? Well, William Beeston seems to know. 1853, the Roman Empire of the Edomite. This is interesting. So Rome was associated to Edom. That's the brother of Jacob, the twin brother, the one that is light-skinned with red features. He was red and hairy. In other words, red hair, light skin, probably freckles. Here's another book. Dr. Binya Yashrael, Esau, Edom, Rome, the hidden identity of the man of sin. So wait a minute, are we associating the church? Are we associating the church with Edom? Remember, when you look at Jordan, the country Jordan, Jordan was Edom at one time in history. But if you look at the rock hotel or the rock buildings in Jordan, they look a lot, if not identical, to the architecture that you see today in Rome. Is it true? Is it not? It sure seems to be. How about this? The Torah.com. Esau, the ancestor of Rome, conquered the Idumeans and forced them to convert to Judaism, Josephus, blah, 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 blah. For a second time, Jacob ruled Esau. So it's going into some details here, but the headline tells it all. Esau, the ancestor of Rome. Okay, what about the Jewish encyclopedia? Jews are very good at record keeping. I love reading their writings because when it comes to history and keeping notes, it's some of the best stuff you'll find. Jewish encyclopedias are incredible. But here we can see same thing, jewishencyclopedia.com. The name Edom is used by the Talmudists for the Roman Empire. And they applied to Rome every passage of the Bible referring to Edom or Esau. That's funny because we read in the book of Joel, I believe it was Joel, it talked about Edom. Why, or no, this was Isaiah, I believe. Edom, why are your robes crimson like the one who treads the great wine press? So the Lord is the one on his day of wrath that treads the great wine press. Who's dressing up like the Lord? The Pope. The Pope is pretending to be the Lord. Remember, when you pray or when you go to confession, who are you repenting to? Are you repenting to Christ? Not in the confessional booth. You're asking the Father for forgiveness. I thought you're not supposed to ask or call any man on earth the Heavenly Father, except for your Father in heaven. What happened there? How about Ishmael? Who's Ishmael? Ishmael, in Islam, Ishmael is regarded as a prophet and ancestor to Muhammad. Okay, so let's put it all together. Edom is Rome. Ishmael is Islam. So that's the Arabian nations. Psalms 83 said that the Romans, Edom, and Ishmael, Islam, would make Israel forget their identity. Can I prove it? You bet I can. A lot of us know about the transatlantic slave trade. As a matter of fact, a lot of people that call themselves Afro-Americans. Now, let me point something out. If Native Americans aren't native to America and they're from Eurasia and they're the tribe of Gad, wonder what the African-Americans are. You wonder why we have these blanket terms like Aboriginal, African-American. You know, you're neither. Like, you're neither. What if the joke is this? What if when the Second Temple collapsed, and the people went from Jerusalem and scrambled into places like Egypt, scrambled into places like Libya, made their way into places like Spain over hundreds of years. What if there was a slave trade that displaced them? And then all of a sudden, they are brought from Africa and brought overseas. Sure, there might be some people that are Hamites or Africans that are mixed in with them. But wouldn't that also mean that some Israelites would also be mixed in with those people? So then were some of the people brought to South America and North America? Are we talking about Israelites? So is that why we see the Cherokee, for example? They've got African DNA. 
They said that they were Mongoloids. They said that they were Negroes. Is this how it happened? Sounds pretty likely. But we've got a problem, though. You see, the transatlantic slave trade, which started with Columbus, which is Edom, which is Rome, that was West Africa. And so most guys from North America, African Americans, and I use that term loosely, when they look for their ancestry, where do they go? They go to West Africa. They go to places like Ghana to try to figure out Nigeria, trying to figure out exactly where their roots are. And then they get caught up in all this tribal stuff or Egyptian stuff. And they believe that they're originally connected to this idea that came out of Egypt. I'm like, no, that's the idea of the Canaanites. You see, if you're a Hamite, sure, you can follow the Canaanite religion and it would suit you. But if you're actually Israel and you've lost your identity and you go to West Africa looking for your identity, and instead, what do you find? You find, well, we must be doing what the Egyptians were doing. You're missing a step. There were two slave trades. The same way they didn't tell you about the fact that, A, hey, there's Hebrew writings all through North America. B, they're left by what looks like Native Americans who aren't native to America. They left out there's a bigger slave trade than the transatlantic slave trade. You've watched all these movies about slavery and all these horrible things that happened, but no one ever pointed out there was a bigger slave trade than this one. That, my friends, is an elephant in the room. Did you know that Islam had a much larger slave trade? There's tons of pictures. You see, Islam came to fruition after Muhammad got the revelation in the cave from the supposed Archangel Gabriel. We're not going to get into that. That's a whole different study. But after this was around 630, I'm going to say 630 AD. I'm sure Islam would agree. That's pretty close. This is when the Quran came to be. So Muhammad recited the Quran. He himself couldn't read or write, but he recited the Quran and others wrote it down for him. And then it wasn't long after that that the Arabian slave trade started. Basically, when they went into places like Africa where the Berbers were and other parts that were pretty close to, I mean, the, the, the Arab slave trade was very large, but Africa was a big piece of it. it was, I'll show you what some of the different years were that it carried on for. But during the slave trade, people were basically asked either submit to Islam, submit to Allah, or become our slaves. The Arab slave trade refers to various periods in which a slave trade has been carried out under the auspices of Arab people or Arab countries. Examples include, now keep in mind, there is just the transatlantic slave trade of the East and West India Trading Company. Here we got a whole bunch. We've got the trans-Saharan slave trade, the Indian Ocean slave trade, Barbary slave trade, slavery in Tunisia, slavery in Libya. Come on, Libya is where the Jews went too. When they left from the Second Temple, I showed you they had to cut through in order to get to Spain. Slavery in Libya, slavery in Sudan, I'm not even sure what this country is, slavery in Mauritania, and slavery in Yemen. There were Christians in Yemen. Not all the Christians or not all of the Jews that had left from the Second Temple when the Romans destroyed it, they didn't all just go into Egypt. Some of them went down the Sinai Peninsula and then made their way into Yemen. That's where you'll find a lot of Christian artifacts left in Yemen. And notice in the Middle East, who is still blowing the crap out of Yemen? Who is attacking Yemen? You can see that there is fights going on with Yemen, with Islam. And so when you look at Psalms 83 and you put it all together, what do you think is happening? Early on in Muslim history, slaves provided plantation labor similar to that in early modern day Americas. But this practice was abandoned after harsh treatment led to destructive slave results. Revolts, sorry. The most notable being the Zanj Rebellion of 869 to 883. So here you can see there's a slave revolt, and this is way back in the day. This is 800 AD. This is way before the transatlantic slave trade even happened. Slaves were widely employed in irrigation, mining, and animal husbandry, but most commonly as soldiers, guards, domestic workers, and concubines. Many rulers relied on military slaves, often in huge standing armies and on slaves and administration to such a degree that the slaves could sometimes seize power. Among the black slaves, there are roughly two females to every one male. To rough, two rough estimates by scholars of the numbers of just one group, black slaves held over 12 centuries in the Muslim world are 11.5 million and 14 million. Why didn't they teach you this in school? This is ginormously larger than the transatlantic slave trade. And if you can see here, there was a rebellion in the 800s. This went on all the way to the 20th century. How come no one talked about this? I never heard about this. I mean, we were actually living a hundred years away from when the slave trade happened and no one told us this happened in school. 11.5 to 14 million black slaves. 
While others estimate, while other estimates indicate a number between 12 and 15 million African slaves prior to the 20th century. This is an elephant in the room. So look at the route. And I mean, this is just like a rough example, but this is only showing the trans-Saharan trans slave trade. There were many slave trades. I think I named like six of them. This is just one of them. And notice here, you can see people that were in Northern Africa were pulled into places like India, pulled into places like Asia, pulled into places like Europe, pulled into places like West Africa. So imagine this, if one slave trade happened that took people from North Africa to West Africa, and then another slave trade happened through Columbus and the Europeans, and that went through the transatlantic slave trade from West Africa to North America, where do you think Israel went? Who do you think the African Americans are? Probably a very similar story to the Native Americans. This is hilarious. And again, if people just read the Bible and believed it and didn't listen to all these stupid documentaries, they'd be able to figure this out. And of course, when we see that there was an India trade route and there was an Asia trade route, if we look back in the book of Genesis, did we see that there were Ishmaelites that were selling people as slaves back then? Yes. Remember, Abraham had a child called Isaac, but before that, he had a child called Ishmael. If you remember, you remember there was a child called Joseph. His brothers were jealous of him because his father, Jacob, liked him the most. He was the youngest. He was the child of Rachel, and Rachel was the wife that Jacob loved. And so that child was thrown into a pit. And when the brothers decided, we're not going to kill our brother. We don't want that sin on us. Instead, what will we do? Here comes an Ishmaelite Midian caravan. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let's sell him to the Midianites. And then Joseph became eventually almost like the Pharaoh in Egypt. That's how far back this goes. It goes back to Genesis. But here we can see with Islam and Islam connecting itself to Ishmael, this concept of slave trade never stopped. As a matter of fact, it only stopped in the 1930s. These were the two slave trades, the transatlantic slave trade and the Arabian slave trade. Why did you hear nothing of it? Psalms 83 is true. Jacob, which is Israel, was made to forget his name. And now you're living in a world that's completely upside down with documentaries just shooting out the silliest of numbers because if you have any biblical knowledge, you can see their chronology is completely out, of, out to lunch. The Bering Strait is impossible. You can't have Gadites with the DNA that they have being 12,000 years old with a land bridge. That's baloney. It didn't exist. That's way before the Gadites time. If we already said that Exodus happened around 1500 BC, and most scholars would all agree unanimously, yeah, that's the time of the Exodus. That's not 12,000 years ago. That predates Gadites by a lot. So I'm glad to see that some people in Canada and the United States are starting to realize, hey, we used to have an identity before we got into the spirit worship, before the totems, before all the stuff that we were doing, we used to be the tribe of Gad. I hope Mexico starts to find out that they're the tribe of Issachar. Issachar was associated to the donkey. As a matter of fact, that derogatory term that's called a wetback, that's associated to something written in the Bible. It's said that Issachar would work and that his back would become wet from the sweat of him working. Well, that's what you see when you go to a tourist resort. It, like, it's so unfair when we look at the way the world's set up where North America, this first world nation, we have all these great luxuries, and then we go on vacation somewhere, and our servants are actually God's chosen people. How, what's the irony of that? I'll give you another one that I know. The Haitians. Okay, We saw that there was a whole list of different people in Psalms 83 that were going to help Israel forget his name. Who are the Haitians? Well, let's, let's start with this. Haitians are dark-skinned people. Haiti, Haiti and Haitian is a French word. Maybe the French colonized them. Are you starting to see what happens here? Do you understand what colonialism was all about? Colonialism was erasing people's identity. It was a genocide, a re-education of their children, and now we have a history that's very ugly. And now we're living in a world where the ones that caused this, they're actually in power. We have a Jesuit Pope today. We have lots of Jesuit leaders today. They were kicked out of Europe 300 times, or sorry, 70 times in 300 years. I would not trust a group that was deceiving people that much that they were kicked out of everywhere in Europe. And then today, they're going to give you the direction. That to me is the elephant in the room. You want to talk about who the synagogue of Satan is? Let me point this out. If we say synagogue, 
we say that would have to do something with Judaism. Does that speak for all Jews? Absolutely not. A man is made by his own decisions. But here's one thing I will point out. Why does the Pope wear a yarmulke? I thought a yarmulke was a hat that was a Jewish symbol. Why are you facing the east when the holy place was in the west? Why are you calling yourself father? Why are you allowing people to confess their sins to you and then forgive them? Edom, I can see you. Why are your robes red? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Brothers and sisters, the sword is coming. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. That, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow.